Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Oh, I've got extra sound happening. How do I fix that? <laughs> My name's Jade, this is How to App on iOS, and it's the interview day, and we have on the show, Ross Double Eight Eight Nine! get stoned. Even space gets high on light when the sun finds its pain. Stillness begins spinning, begets the atom. Hemlocks and cedars lit from their roots up. Underground mycelium fix of golden mushrooms. Earth wobbles off her axis, but this dizziness isn't her fault. Blame God, the first pusher of all the in the beginning, angels passed out cups of this stuff at the feast where we can see the galaxy. Now we nod in a fuzz of stars, a quantum snow of bliss. Oh, we're drifting nuclei, connected by dilated gazes. We've learned to mingle our roots like a giant fungus. This is about the astonishment of the heart, 
How do you do, everybody? I hope you're all doing well. Welcome to the show. That was... Oh, oh, hang on a minute. What's going on? Jesus, YouTube, get your crap together. So that was uh, Russ8889. And that was his latest track, I do believe, Imaginarium. And this is How to App on iOS. My name is Jade Star. Welcome to the show. There is a hell of a lot of you here. If you are watching on Facebook, I don't know what you're doing. Come over here to YouTube, or you can now go to, uh, so I'll let you know, you can come to youtube.com slash jadestar, you can go to the website at howtoapponiOS.com and watch the show live in the browser, and today for the first time we are streaming at Twitch, on the Twitch, Twitch TV, twitch.tv slash howtoapponiOS, and there is 44 of you here in the chat, so thank you so, so much for being here today, and there's seven of you over there on Twitch, welcome all board, Twitches, I'm Twitching away myself and i can see one person over there on facebook thank you all for joining me today we have well one of the most eclectic one of the most talented and one of the most just inspiring people i know uh he's uh, i found i came across him on this channel he's uh just an incredible artist has an incredible story and you know what he's a really great friend of mine and to many of us here in the chat so without further ado i would like to welcome to the chat ladies and gentlemen russ 8889 how are you going today russ yes i'm good thank you hello everyone <laughs> in the room tonight i hope you're all suitably prepared for this evening like i am <laughs> <laughs> suitably prepared <laughs> are, you, are you controlling your language tonight russ <laughs> no i just want to say if you're offended by shit cunt bollocks fuck it i, I would leave now <laughs> we're off and racing folks <laughs> welcome my friend <laughs> firstly I, I just want to thank you so much for you know taking the time to come out and do this because it's uh i'm super stoked as you can tell I'm excited, man. <laughs> I'm excited. All right, so no, I'm glad you invited me on the show. It's uh, going to be a good time. Uh, <laughs> Codename Salad says I'm here for the swearing. Well, you come to the right <laughs> fucking place. <laughs> We're going to get demonetized. Certainly, fucking that, mate. <laughs> We're getting demonetized today, folks. <laughs> it's all happening. Uh, if you're over on the Twitch, welcome. Also, too, if you're if you're not uh, familiar with the show, what we do here is uh, we talk iOS, how to make music, mental health and well-being, all this kind of stuff, and we inter interview great artists like Russ. So let's get straight to it. I'm going to ask you the first question I ask every. Everybody, Russ, what does music mean to you, Russ? Oh, music means to me. Well, I think um, music means to me it's a time stamp throughout your life. Um, it's responsible for creating memories. Um, you can't really get away from music wherever you go because it's intertwined with everything we do. If you're sitting in your car or you're waiting on the phone or you're go to a movie or you're watching a film um you know you can't really get away from music and i don't know making my own music is like a journey that you never know where it's going to end up mm -hmm. like like i like listening to some music i like lots of all sorts of different music and you know it gives me something that really occupies what I do. So, you know, I'm glad of it in that respect that I'm into music because there's not a lot of hobbies I can go and really do now. So I wouldn't be good around the badminton court. <laughs> 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 so, uh, regarding music, uh, do you recall the music that was played in your house when you were a kid? And did it have an influence on the music that you 
have made in the past and make now? Not a fucking bit. <laughs> um, the, the the music that my mum and dad used to listen to was, I don't know, like people like Barbara Streisand and oh, lovely. Nat King Cole, like basically um, Barry Manilow. Oh, we love the all the Barry. shit art. All the shit artists I wouldn't listen to. The most exciting thing that used to get played in the car was a bit of ABBA. And that was about as exciting as it got. Oh, what a thrill ride. Like, <laughs> and it was only... <laughs> and the funny thing, like, my mum likes country and western and all that. And she was like, yeah, but you used to like that song. Um, you know, who sang it? Like, and I was trying to think who'd sung this song. And she went... I said, country and western song, you know, promise me son. And I, what, I was like, oh, what, that song about gang rape? Oh, wonderful, mum. <laughs> <laughs> so, and she's like, what do you mean? I'm like, have you never listened to the words of it? And she's like, no. So I got the Alexa to play the song. And she was like, oh, my God, I can't believe I used to play this in the car. <laughs> <laughs> a song for mum this mother's day treat your mum to the best of gang rape because <laughs> <laughs> that's basically what the song is about you know yeah yeah well <laughs> a lot of people don't listen to the lyrics do they they just they like what they hear and... no it's got a good tune <laughs> you know you know you bumble along with it you know the eight track flicks on to the next track you might rewind it again Press it to play again, give it another go. And there's me sitting in the back of the car going, oh, yeah, can you play that country song again? <laughs> it's, so, it's a good toe tapper, except for the woman being raped. <laughs> <laughs> but really, you know, it's it's not really the best kind of lyrics for a song, but there you go. That's country and western for you. It's, it's all a bit up and down. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of sadness in country and western, and I, I've always found uh, with country and western, there's always somebody who's been victimised in country and western. You know, it's a, a... well, normally the listener. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh man, so true. Uh, put a one in the chat, which I shouldn't really, I shouldn't really say that as my wife loves country and western. <laughs> Hi, Liz. <laughs> Sorry, I was just about to put, get everyone to put a one in the chat if you hate country and western. <laughs> oh dear. It's some country from, it's just some come from Preston, and they are, I don't know. Nice. <laughs> Boom! We are off to the races, folks. <laughs> and <laughs> racing in the swearing Olympics, and they're off. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness uh, Dean's put a one in the chat Dean hates it So uh, Stephen Rimmer loves it Give Stephen Rimmer some He loves a little bit of country and western Alright Rimmer um, So what was the Do you recall the first album that you purchased Or and or and or Was given And what format was it on I can do better than that uh, You've got it Whoa. That's the first single I ever owned. Holy, holy I don't know if you can see that. Yes, yes. It's Vertigo, so is it? Autobahn Craftwork. Well, that was the first single that I that, owned. Yeah. It was the first <laughs> single I can remember. Me mum asking me mum um, because I was like, oh, can you get that car record? Can you get that car record? And then I think the first album I, I actually bought myself one shitty kiss. It was um, Adam and the Ants, Kings of the Wild Frontier would have been the first album I, I nice. really, truly remember buying. And then like, the biggest love of my life for listened for years was this album, which is like electronic music. So everything that was on that was like sped up craft work and that's what got me into electronic music right so um and and who are some of your just rattle off some of your favorite bands favorite bands or, you know artists artist bands <laughs> yeah i mean so artists would be like a guy called one atkins like i like left field i like craft work 
my favourite band is Pink Floyd. I like a lot of classic rock bearing sort of like from The Who, Led Zeppelin, Jimi Hendrix, all stuff like that. I like stuff like The Cure and The Mission and sort of like gothic -y sort of types of music. I like, you know, I like reggae. I like, I like so many different styles of music that it's really hard to pinpoint. But my favourite era of music is from 88 to 89 that's why it's in the name not only was it when i really got into music it was like like the big acid house thing that was a really big thing for me that was lots of going out and good times so what so what is the exact meaning of russ 88 89 is it is it so the exact meaning on it is firstly when I really got into music in a big way, i.e. going out. And that's when I started to seriously get into, like, nightclub music, like DJing, like, trying to... Uh, I started with, like, an SH-101 that I used to try and play lines over in the records that I used to mix. Because I always used to think, oh, I can hear, oh, if it just had this noise in it or something. And so that's when I truly sort of started, like, seriously thinking about music. And then it wasn't until a couple of years later, a really good friend of mine, Steve, he introduced me to um, who ended up being the best man at my wedding, a guy called Kevin, and we sat down and we started recording together. He had a, uh, an Atari computer. We had Pro 24 on it. We had a little Elise's drum machine. And I had shitloads of records that we could get samples from. So that was really the start of it all. He used to come around to a, a room I used to rent just to play music, to play me records in. And... Like, we used to come around there, we used to set up, and we used to start to make music. So that's really how I sort of got into making music. Yeah, I find it really interesting, too, when I, uh, I met you, that, you know, I, uh, my first impressions, you know, you, you take your first impressions and you, you hold on to them. We do it like it's just natural as a species. And um, it's not always the best way, you know. We often do judge books by by their covers. And um, when I first came across you, I thought you were just predominantly like an electronic artist. And then I started to, you know, hear that you, you know you like stuff like Pink Floyd and all the bands that you mentioned just previously. I, I find it really it, it's rare that you come across people that um, have really interest in like rock music and progressive stuff like Pink Floyd and then electronic music. And it really shows in, in your music uh, that you, you blend a lot of uh, styles in there. So um, from, uh, if, you, if you've released stuff previously, when was the first kind of time you, you started releasing music? I would say the first actual record release was around 1990, somewhere around there. Right, and so, so that's a few years ago. That was um, with the guy Kevin that I'm talking about. We got together and we released three records together over like between 1990 and maybe 92, something like that. So that's when we had the bug for actually doing or stepping up to actually release music because it was so much different in them days to release music. It's not like today you can just upload to DistroKid. Like the, there was a whole thing of going into a recording studio, getting the engineer to do a mix of it for you, getting it then taken to the record place that would cut the records, then going to the record pressing plant get the records cut, then going out and distributing the records yourself, driving around in your car with a box full of records, going around all the shops, handing them out, or trying to sell them, should I say. So it was very different in them days to what it is now. 
Yeah, look, and a lot of young people now who are living in this digital era have no idea about that whole process, you know, even though vinyl is making a comeback. What, what's your opinion on the way the music industry has changed from those days of, um, you know, the, the whole process? Because it, it was, a, a you know, going into a studio, recording things, uh, uh, you know, getting things mastered, you'd send it off somewhere else, you'd send it to a mastering person, they'd send it back, then you'd hit a, a processing plant. What what, do you, what is, are your thoughts on today's industry with the digital releases compared to the old methods? I think um, it's a lot more accessible to everyone because I was only chatting uh, tonight with my friend Steve about this. I was saying, you know, in, in the days that I was doing it, like, firstly, you had to have a recording studio or, you know, or means to make the music, which used to be quite a lot of money to buy the keyboards and computer and and now when you can make something on your iPhone which you carry about with you all day and you know make a record and put it up to DistroKid and I think that's really really good but it's so so different to the way I come down the road to it and that's why for me personally like the buzz of maybe releasing something digitally isn't really prevalent for me because I couldn't really give a fuck. You know, I've already done it on vinyl. I've done it on CD. Yes, I would release something onto a digital stream, but it's only just a really for me to complete the circle of being able to say, oh, I've done it on this, done it on that, and I've done it on that. It's not the be all and the end all to me to do it is you know i don't see it as unless you're very very good a big money making kind of thing i used to do it for a living i wouldn't be able to do that now yeah right because i like doing fuck all for a living now <laughs> <laughs> So, so as an electronic artist, you know, and, and again, there, there could be people here who are watching. I mean, where record stores, I mean, especially electronic music, uh, the whole process of electronic music was going to record stores and going through vinyl and having a collection of vinyl. That's, you know, I remember so many of my friends, I was into death metal bands, but I had a lot of friends in electronic music. And that whole thing, that I'd always have a friend... It was an electronic artist carrying around a little shoulder bag full of vinyl in their bag that they would carry around with them wherever they went. Was that the same kind of thing with you? Yeah, I mean, I used to spend fortunes on records. I mean, again, I was talking tonight about it. It's not like, for example, if you want a sample of, you know, saying or the other, you just go on YouTube and you can download it. In them days, it was a case of going around millions of, well, not millions, but going around lots of record stores, going in second-hand junk shops and finding all the records in junk shops just to find a certain drum break or, you know, just some sort of part of that music that you could use in what you was doing. And in them times, like, sampling was such a big, part of the music like the dance music thing everything was samples it's not like music is today where more stuff is sort of played in unless you was in a like a, a formal sort of band with a guitar and a bass and whatever yeah like electronic music was was really a black to make really like it was you know, you didn't, and I still haven't got any musical skills at all. I couldn't play a keyboard, can't play a guitar, can't play the drums, but I know how to put different sounds together. And that's just come from all the years of doing sampling stuff. All I'm basically doing now is just resampling like the different sounds in the iPad and putting them together. So... You know, anyone can really do it. It's not a, a, you know, magic thing, circle kind of thing you have to be in. If you set your mind to it and you kind of know how music sounds by listening to it, I think you could have a pretty good go at it. Yeah, look, and we talk about this all the time, like on this particular channel too. 
music you don't need to know a musical instrument or know all the scales or be a professionally trained singer with these days you know anybody can pick up music and it's like anything if you really actually want to play music you just can play it because pete john says it all the time everybody starts at zero and if you actually want to go from zero to ten it's up to you you know um to to go there yeah i mean i don't know like i've always called myself a technician not a musician because like everything back in them days was done on like with a mouse like you know my friend kev would be sitting at the controls and i would be digging through finding all samples that we could put together so it was a totally different way of how i obviously work today but that was part of how it was done and that's what everybody in the dance genre of music was doing like house and techno like there was just a formula to the music like there is lots of different music there's a certain formula and if you're in that groove that's the formula you work to if you play rock music you play reggae you know it's got its groove it's got its set do's and don'ts and as long as you stay in them guidelines you're pretty well sorted very true i'm just going to say hello to the folks in the chat just we'll scroll from the bottom because i know there's a hell of a lot of you here you've broken the record today russ 56 people i told you you're going to break the record oh thank you thank you all for coming well done um so stephen rimmer hello tom rochelle synth widows here doug from the sound test room uh michael zealand andy goldsby scott liz who is russ's partner welcome aboard liz auntie g is here electrona sounds audio is here hello to you sm borthwick wall is here jim shannon sounds who else do we have throw your name in the chat so i can see you as you pop up kim harden hudson is here dean thomas hello i saw gary hubs i saw thomas galane just type something in the chat and I'll read it as they're popping up. Uh, Ian Luckett, Andy Dion, Jacob Hack is here. Hello, Jacob. Thanks for joining us. Russ, you're pulling out all the stars today. You've got the whole community here for you. You're, you're, you're... Oh, well, I thank them all for turning out. <laughs> yeah, look, thanks. Uh, the Garage Band Guide is here. Patrick is here. Look, there's Joey Helpish. Hello. Derek Smith is here. Danny Broderick. Wow, Globe Flicker, there are so many people there. Thank you so very much. Colin Powell is here. Codename Salad. Thanks, guys, for typing in your names. And, and uh, Dr. Zarders is here as well. Saga Kadabra. <laughs> We've got them all here. We've got Thomas Galane. He's over on the Twitch because we're streaming to Twitch for the first time. That's super exciting. Paul Mint, um, Patrick Chandler, Scott. My Lord, there are so many people. I thank you so, so very much for being here. Um, so Russ, with your uh, music, uh, Stephen Rimmer, iOS Music Man, Pete Johns. Sorry, I'm still uh, catching up with names as they come in. With your uh, Stu Cash is here as well too. With your music, Russ. So uh, Cuby the Penguin, hello Cuby. Wow, it's just an it's a it's a cavalcade of stars. Uh, <laughs> 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 Everyone's here to see yeah. Russ. Give us the fucking hard truth, mate. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> too fucking right mate <laughs> howdy doody howdy doody to you howdy doody and um so with your music that you made so uh, like you weren't somebody who like you weren't a dj or anything like this so uh, was your music played at, at, at clubs it was by djs or what well fucking cheek i wasn't a dj oh, all right well i don't know <laughs> i'm asking I, I, I don't know if you were or not <laughs> <laughs> Spin that sucker, baby. <laughs> nah, I mean, like, I wasn't big time DJ. I used to DJ at, like, house parties and, like, I used to deal um, with Spiral Tribe. I used to play uh, music for them and I used to DJ in, in clubs. Like, my friend who we ended up doing music with, he was the main DJ... Um, like he used to play Ministry of Sound, so I used to get to spin in the Ministry of Sound sometimes. And he would, we was, we had that envoy to be able to take our music and get it played in the clubs. We 
we was in the sort of circle of a lot of DJs and we was able to, you know, walk into the DJ booths and hand the records to the DJs and get them to spin it. So we was lucky in that regard. So um, DJing for me was from a young age, really, um, probably the funniest place I ever DJed <laughs> was I'd done a disco for the death, believe <laughs> <laughs> but that that's all about turning up the bass and having the big bass sound so they can hear the thumping bass but what really fucked it up was I, I was like oh no one's really dancing you know no one's getting into it and I went and turned the lights off to create a bit of atmosphere and after about 10 minutes this woman come over she was like do you think you can turn the lights back on no one can sign to each other they can't talk to each other <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i've had some interesting <laughs> dj experiences i must say <laughs> oh shit um thank you to pete johns also who's put in a super chat there uh for he said uh, setting up a fund to cover the rust swear jar so, <laughs> so thank you very much uh, joey helpish also for the swear jar <laughs> don't don't worry pete i've got you covered i've got me carrot mate if i want to really swear <laughs> Oh my god, he's got props. Can you believe it? He's got props. Um, for the swear jar. Uh, thank you. I, I ain't got it. Hang on, you've got. I, I, I know. I know. Pete recommended the carrot and and a nice drink to drink for for the Australian. Cheers. Product placement. Though he recommended this beer to me, but it's a load of shit. I must. Oh my god, he's drinking Foster's. Dude, don't do it, man. Don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. You'll oh, man, we, we use that stuff for toilet cleaner here in Australia. <laughs> Seriously. That's about all it's yeah. good for. It's clean my stomach out. <laughs> Who needs laxatives? Foster's lager. Uh thank you. Uh, uh, I reckon it just fucking makes you swear more. I don't know why he recommended it to me. It's because it's fucking awful. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Doug, from the sound test room, who's kindly sent a super chat as well. Dean Thomas also. Thank you, guys. The swear jar. Vote for the swear jar. It's filling up. <laughs> the swear jar's filling up. We're going to have to give you a cut, Ross. <laughs> <laughs> um, good stuff uh, where am I I'm totally lost where else uh, so South Circular Recordings yeah Couldn't that tell. was a big part of my growing up so South Circular Recordings was myself my friend Kev and my friend Matt who's now living in Berlin still carrying on DJing he moved there because the techno scene is now in really Germany and he still runs a record label and he still DJs. I think he's, um, he goes under the name radio slave. Yep. So if anyone wants to check his stuff out, he's pretty cool. DJ does a lot of techno stuff, but South circular recordings sort of come about, um, from the first, stuff that me and my friend used to do which went under the name Simpty we think we needed um, someone who could really like you know he was it DJing at the club so he could really take the music forward a bit for us and I met him through a mutual school friend actually who, who said, oh, like, there's this guy who wants to come round, make a record, can you do a record for him? Now, me and my friend were like, yeah, we got samplers and all, all the kit. So so this guy come round, um, who's also a DJ, um, he went on to be in a, performed as a band, quite done quite well in America, actually, called Dirty Vegas and he come round with a bag full of records and he was like oh can you sample this sample that sample this for us and we put a collection of samples and he went out and sold a load of records and we was like bloody hell and he brought 
um, who <laughs> who was there to just sort of see what was going on because he was into music but had no idea how to make music and he come along and we sort of got to know him and said why don't you come and join what we're doing because you've got some ideas or some tracks you want to do like come and join us and we'll see if we can do some stuff together and luckily the first track we kind of put together was um was a sort of remix sort of remix of last night dj saved my life by in deep and we took that record and we gave it to kiss fm dj uh who's called graham gold and he just started slamming it on his radio station so we was really lucky in the fact that it was getting listened to and not in high demand by any means, <laughs> but it, it was in a demand. So, so, Sorry. so that really sort of bankrolled it. We, we all, we between us, we started with five hundred quid. So, you know, it was like, you know, a couple of hundred quid each, just under that, and to get five hundred records pressed. And once we got the 500 records pressed, then like that was the sort of platform to move forward. So, so SCR we run from 92, 93 up until 98 when we finally got ripped off by a big distributor and basically run off with all our money so that was the end of that so we all had to go and get proper jobs in. <laughs> but i lived the life of being able to get up um we used to work from two o'clock in the afternoon till seven o'clock in the evening and that allowed us to like me and friend was djing at clubs and stuff and we used to go out probably three nights in the week to different clubs uh, listen to what was going on so it allowed us to have a really good sort of lifestyle really and still make music in between that so like you know for them few years it was a really good time it's something that I'm glad I've done and looking back on it it's maybe not the you know the biggest fortune you could have made out of doing it but it certainly paid the bills and it was a lifestyle and we basically just sort of blagged it all the way through we was we was really lucky um like i think i think the third release we'd done um we had a guy phone us up from a promotions company and i was really juvious he was like oh why don't you why don't you come and see us? Like, we reckon we can promote your record for you. And I was like, yeah, I don't know. And it was, I forget where it was. It was up in, like, North London. It was nearly where Virgin Records were, like, their main head office. And, again, my friend who was DJ, and he knew the guy who was A&R. His name was Rob Manley, I think. He was the A&I guy at Virgin Records, and he was like, look, let's go up there. We're, we'll go and see what they're saying, and afterwards I'll pop in, I'll see Rob. So we went up there, and again, uh, they sort of said to us, oh, look, you know, one of our DJs, Justin Robinson, who's playing for us, he's, he's playing your record. He really likes it. He's played it to us, and we're like, yeah, no, it's really good we think we can do something with it. And um, I was like, yeah, okay. And so he said to me, oh, just drop us up 200 records. We're putting all the record mailers that, we, that we're getting paid to send out and we'll just drop your record in with them. And if you get something big come out of it, he said, then you can think about paying us. He said, if nothing really comes of it, he said, 
you don't know us anything. He said, we'll just do it for you because we like your record. So I was lucky in that respect that for the promotional side of stuff, they were sending it out for us. And then on the flip side of it, as we did start getting bigger, I just started dropping bigger bags of goodies up there for them. <laughs> <laughs> so it kept them sweet. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so they was happy and we was happy. So I'm sure you were happy. Like, <laughs> yeah, no, totally. But again, that was just part of the rock and roll. It, I don't it know, you know, it's... It's just how business was done back then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I feel so much pity for people who missed out on a lot of that era. Like, you know, across all genres of music, you know, so, you know, uh, electronic music, metal, rock. I mean, there were things that were done on the dodge and and uh, and, and bands got burnt, people got ripped off and, you know, there's a that was the industry and it's it's kind of sad how things these days have so watered down and not so dangerous anymore. Yeah, I mean, them days you had to go out there and do it. These days you can sit in your room and your ass and just do it. You know, although we were had a home recording studio, and it, I mean, it's just, I don't know how to put it, but it was just like a big blag, really, because we would print the records up we would have uh, um, um, like the phone number on there. We'd have a fax machine, and then we'd get like as as DJs were starting to play the stuff. Like at three o'clock in the morning, the phone would ring. You think, "Who the fuck's that?" And it'd be some fax chugging through. It'd be like da 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 da. Like you go downstairs, and you go, what the fuck's this? And it, it would be like a fax from like Sony or Avex or someone saying, Oh, can we license your music? Oh, we got this compilation album coming out. Can we fit your music on there? And uh, we was like, Yeah, by sure, send us a contract. We'll read through the contract. Or, or I would say, Yeah, for sure, send us your contract. We'll get our lawyers to look over it for you. And um, so, like, we just used to, whatever the contract they sent us, we would just send it back to I agree with a different kind of figure. So we would always try and up it by 5%, 10% on what they offered us. And generally... They would think you're serious and you knew what you was doing. So they would just say, oh, okay, then. And then we used to say to them, because to FedEx a uh, record to like Japan or America or Brazil or somewhere would cost a lot of money. So we just used to say, oh, I used to say to them, yeah, can you just send your FedEx guy here and we'll send that off? <laughs> like we, we was like, yeah, fuck paying 50 quid to send the FedEx. <laughs> so so we just blagged it all the way through. We'd like, we, um, we, people thought that we was, if you could have taken the photo of three guys sitting in a room smoking joints all day, pissing about on keyboards, they wouldn't have believed it, you know, they wouldn't have taken you seriously. So it, that was like the disclosure side of it that I used to deal with. I used to deal with all the sort of, like the business end of it, so to speak, or the blagging end of it, so to speak. And, you know, Matt would be there thinking, oh, this this song works really well in the club if we made something like this and my friend Kevin would sit there and he'd be the architect he'd, he'd, he'd get it together and I'd go in and I would like mix with the sounds or you know, you would be 303s or whatever to, to make in the sound but my friend Kev's really the true master of it all because he had the patience to sit there to get the sound perfect Whereas I'll be like, yeah, fuck it, that would do. <laughs> so, so he was, so he would, between the three of us, my friend Matt also done like the graphic design. So 
all our record labels he would design. So we had the whole thing in the house and, you know, we just blagged it all the way through and, you know, didn't make a rock and roll like mansion living out of it, but we made a living out of it. You know, it was a good time to be had. Absolutely. Sounds, sounds awesome. And, you know, I, I was kind of on the opposite scale at the time with uh, metal music doing the same kind of thing. It was happening across all genres. What we're going to do, uh, we're going to play one of your tracks. Uh, we're going to play, uh, uh, we'll play this track and then we'll come back and talk about it. And then we'll talk about some life changing events that went down in your life. So we'll uh, pop this up, give it a play. If you want to chuck mute on your mic, I'll mute my mic. And okay. Folks, you can chill out and have a listen to this and then we'll see you all on the other side of this track. And I'm sorry for the interruptions that are happening. Like there's something, seems like something's trying to hack the stream, some kind of footage of some weird old wizard or something. I'm so I'm sorry about that. It's, it's the internet. So anyway, relax and chill out to this awesome track by Ross.
Oh yeah, hello, welcome back everybody. <laughs> I'm so something so was pouring. <laughs> I'm so mouth. sorry about that. <laughs> something happened to the stream. Uh, I think I've fixed the problem, so we're all good there. Welcome back. So Russ, uh, that was awesome. Tell us, tell us a bit about that track. Well, I just went and got my hair done. You've been. Oh my god! Thing, what, but... the hell? <laughs> <laughs> what the hell happened? Oh, Jesus Christ! <laughs> He's gone Rastafarian. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought I'd join you. Look, you, it was quite inspiring. Yeah, yeah yours didn't cost $500, I'll bet. <laughs> <laughs> yours looks better than mine, uh, actually. <laughs> it's about 50p. You should come here over here, love. Fuck's sake. Man, I got ripped off. Hey, I also want to thank uh, Jacob Hack for uh, the kind super chat as well. Thank you, Jacob, for that. Uh, that was very kind of you. Uh, so, Russ, who is your hairstylist? <laughs> Well, my hairstylist is this person called Amazon. I don't know if you've heard of her. She's pretty good. Like She's very effective, and she comes to order. Yeah, I, I've heard about her. Let me bring her to attention. Hey, Alexa. Everyone's Alexa just went off there. <laughs> um, so tell us about that song that we just heard. Um, what? Deep in the powder, I'll let you make your own mind up. <laughs> so I thought it was a song about when you were a baby and you're recalling, you know, when you may have soiled yourself and a bit of baby powder afterwards. No? Am I wrong? No, it's a fucking groovy 90s, mate. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so... <laughs> look at that <laughs> you look beautiful, by the way. Liz, what do you think? Oh, in the thank chat? you. It's a... <laughs> Is it doing it for you, Liz? <laughs> well, I know how much Liz would like this. Yeah. <laughs> you look like Fabio at the moment with the way you're playing with your hair. <laughs> Holy shit. We've gone off the rails, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let's, let's, let's get a little bit serious if we can. So I want to talk about the life-changing event that, that happened. All right. So, All right. We're, we're going to get a bit... Well, I've got to say, that was a right carrot when that happened. I've got to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. So, Hang on. I've got to take this wig off. <laughs> Hang on. All right. We'll, we'll cut away. To something <laughs> while you're doing that, just to give you some privacy. Oh look! Oh look! This guy's back. <laughs> oh shit! Who is, who is this guy? He keeps waving at me. <laughs> hey, welcome! Whoa! What a difference, man! What a difference! Uh, I need some more of this shit. <laughs> <laughs> Don't drink too much of that stuff, man. You're gonna. It's bad for you. It's gonna hurt. It's gonna hurt in the morning. <laughs> it's like a. It's got like a dodgy vindaloo. <laughs> Um, Thomas Guyton says, wait a sec, that was a wig? <laughs> uh, thank you all still for... <laughs> pull your wig. They always say, pull your wig back. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we're going to be talking about Sticky Vicky. <laughs> uh, so, anyway... I like a mate, Blue Tack Betty, first. <laughs> so, what do you what do you think about Sticky Vicky, <laughs> Russ? Well, I'll tell you what, I know where she could put that. <laughs> All right, I'm supposed to be getting serious here. All right, so so look, let's 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 get down to it. You had a massively life changing event. Yeah, that was a right fucker. Yeah. And absolutely kicking the balls. So so you had a stroke and um and it's it, it Yeah, it's... left me with me um I don't know if you can see that. So it totally, oh, well, put it in camera. There, yeah. there you go. So it totally fucked the use of me right hand, um, me right leg. You probably think I am I might be pissed, but it's not. It's because, like, this side of my face, the muscles in it don't work. So um, it basically slurs me words. You know, it gives me the sound of being pissed. And um, um, when it first happened, 
uh, like I couldn't hardly ever like talk at all. Like you know, I was like. But uh, how much of it do you want to know? Do you want to know from when it happened or yeah, how it's changed me? Like, like, whatever you want to tell, well, uh, you know, whatever you're comfortable with, because it's a it's a big thing, you know. This is well, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> it's happened. It's happened. But I, I know you don't. But, like, but you do, like at the same time, you know. But look, you've overcome. I, I, I want to hear it as much as you want to give us. I mean. So, I mean, so, the start yeah. of it, I was I was just sitting on my bed watching the American Grand Prix, quite happy, and I was like, God, I feel a bit dizzy. And I went up to go for a piss, and like, I basically collapsed on the floor. And like, I was laying on the floor thinking, God, something's not right here. Like, why has my legs stopped working? Like, what's going on here? Now, at the time this was happening, I had my mobile phone was on the bed, but I got fitted sheets so I couldn't pull the phone towards me to make a phone call. And like, so I was laying on the floor thinking, oh, what the fuck's going on here? And, and then they have an advert on the TV in the UK, I don't have to have it in Aust- oh, excuse me, Australia which is fast, you know, it's like face, arms, blah, blah, blah. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, fucking hell, I bet I'm having a stroke. That's a bit of a bastard. Yeah. So all I could think about was like, oh, I'm fucking bursting for a piss, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I could I could reach up on my shelf and I got myself a pint glass and I relieved myself in the pint glass oh and I was God, like, oh, man. thank fuck for that. Holy shit. I was, well, I didn't, want to, oh, I didn't want to piss myself, you know what I mean? Yeah. I couldn't get up and wash my hands. <laughs> so, 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 I basically laid on the floor and I was like, well, I, you know, what can you do? There's not a lot I can do. I couldn't stand up. I couldn't walk. Like, like I was upstairs, so I couldn't, I couldn't get to me phone. Uh, I was like, shit, that's a bit of a fucker. So, I basically pulled the pillow off my bed and just went asleep on the floor. So I slept for a few hours on the floor, and I suppose it must have been about, I don't know, the racing was on. It was about half twelve, one o'clock. And I woke up about half five in the morning and I was like, ah, shit. No, it's not gone away. I still can't walk and I can't use my arm. Oh, that's a fucker. And, like, somehow I managed to muster the power to get myself back up onto the bed. And, like, once I got back onto the bed, then I could get out. But the problem then was I couldn't really speak. So, you know, that was a bit of a problem. So I got taken from where I live in London, in South London, to, like, the specialist hospital for, like, neurological stuff. Um, But the window on a stroke is about an hour. They can like, relieved the clock within an hour, but because I'd been laying on the floor for the night, it sort of went past that point of them really being able to do something for you. So, <laughs> so I'm, I'm pretty fucked up, right? So I'm, I'm laying in the hospital bed and, like, you know, there's people who've had strokes and, like, the general sort of A&E that you get in hospitals. And, like... Like I can hear the nurse coming down the thing, and she's and she's talking like I can like because obviously there's just a curtain, so I can hear her saying to the woman next door, "Yeah, no, it's all right. We need to do this. Like it's you know it, we don't know if your throat's closed up or what muscles are working in your throat. It's so we can feed you. So they was trying to put a feeding tube into them, and I was. So she come in to me, and I'm like, you fuck off. <laughs> I'm like, there's no way you're sticking that tube 
down my throat. And she's like, oh, no, it's just a procedure. It's something we've got to do. I said, oh. like, now, my mum was in the hospital with me, and, like, she's got... She, now, my poor mum, like, she's going, oh, I don't think he's really going to have that. And I'm like, fucking, fucking, crap, fucking, ain't fucking... Die. Oh, I'm going mad. I'm like, I'm not having that. So they took me from there to um, to be x-rayed. I suppose they do like a scan on the brain. And so I'm laying down on this gurney. Now it's probably nine o'clock in the morning by now. And I'm so thirsty. So I said to the nurse, oh, can you get us a drink? And the stupid... Fuck her, right? She come up to me, and I'm laying flat on my back, and she poured, like, water in my mouth. So I'm choking on this water. I'm like, fucking hell, like, she ain't even lifted my head up. So so she's gone, oh, like, the, um, you know, the muscles in your neck aren't working because you're coughing the water up. I'm not, I'm not coughing the water up. I'm like, you're a stupid cunt who's fucking poured it down my throat. So she's like, well, I'm sorry. Like, no, I, you know, I think you're choking. So the doctor come round <laughs> and the nurse, the nurse goes to the doctor. Oh, yeah, his throat's all closed up. Um, he needs to be on a... Um, I forget what they call it. It's a, like a mush food diet, yeah. you know, like you know, mush mince meat. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Uh, so they put me up onto the ward. or It wasn't a ward. It was in intensive care as it happened. So they put me in intensive care. And then they stuck a thing on the top of my head board saying, like, you know, no solid food, can only have this all the water's got to be thickened up. Now, they're telling me I can't drink, and I've got a bottle of Lucozaid sitting on my table that I'm drinking, and I'm like, what do you mean I can't drink? I'm like, I reckon after the first probably day or so, like, I could like, I could swallow properly again on, you know, 90%. So... I was like, I can't understand it. And I fought for the hospital for weeks that take this fucking sign down off me, like all this nutrition stuff. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, get the dietitian in here and get her to feed me something. I said, because I can't eat another mince meal. Like, I mean, mum's bringing me in like roast dinners and I'm having McDonald's. And um, fair play to me brother. He come to the hospital every day and he supported me in the hospital. He made sure he come from work every day. And I know he hates hospitals, so you know, I'm thankful for that. Um he paid for me wife to fly over from America. Um like, and all the time I was probably the first two weeks where I really couldn't really talk at all or, you know, I could hardly move. Like, I really didn't want to see my missus because for me, it was, I'm the one who looks after her, not the other way around. And I was, I don't know, almost embarrassed for her to see me like that, which on reflection was the worst thing I should have done. Um, but that was just my pride. So once I'd been in hospital for, I don't know, three weeks, they were saying to me, right, you know, you'll get physiotherapy, they're going to do all this, do, you know, you'll do that. Now, when I was in hospital, um, I insisted that every day they took me at least to the shower and to the toilet. They used to come around with the bedpan and I'd be like, nope, not to, not going on it. And they'd be like, well, you can't walk. I'm like, I don't give a fuck. Like, I'm not shitting laying down. And they was like, well, you know, you, you know, you can't get up. I'm like, I don't care. So the doctor come around and he's like, 
oh, yeah, I'm going to prescribe you laxatives. And I'm like, why are you prescribing me laxatives? He said, well, you ain't been to the toilet for three days. And I'm like, that's because your lazy fucking nurses won't take me into the toilet. It's the only reason I ain't had a shit. And so um, I don't know if my brother's in the chat. Yeah, my brother's in the chat. So he'll tell you, like, we fought with the nurses. Like, they give me a lot of problems. They wasn't really doing, for me personally, what they should have been doing. They, like... You know, they sort of left you in the corner and, like, I was only asking for little things to make my life a little easier in the hospital. So there'd be a telly there. So I'm like, oh, great, at least I can sit in bed and watch telly. Fucking put me in the bed, telly don't work. And I'm like, I'm like, the telly doesn't work? And the fucking nurse turned around to me, the cheeky fucker, and went, yeah, well, I'm not a TV repair man. And I was going fucking mental. And I ended up getting moved from three different wards. <laughs> I went through two hospitals and three different wards because they thought I was a problem patient. And so I ended up on this ward. And like the nurse come up to me, nice, nice nurse called Mary, and she's like, What's your problem? Like you've been sent here, and like this is where they send all the problem patients. I'm like, right, this is my problem. I've paid for a TV card, cost me fifty quid. I said, and TV don't fucking work. I said, all I can do is watch TV. That's all I can. Like I'm laying here. That's the least I can do. So she's like, okay, we'll move you to a bed with the telly. Okay, what else? And I'm like. All I want to do is go to the toilet. Is someone to take me for a shit? So she went, okay, like, that's no problem. So what is a big problem? And I'm like, well, you tell me, because everywhere I've been, that's apparently a massive problem to ask for a shower and a shit a day. So, um, so finally, she goes, all right, she said, I'll, <laughs> I'll get you a nurse and I'll... I'll um, I'll get you a toilet. So they put me in a room with four people. So as you walked in, so as a visitor, you'd walk in and like my bed was up there next to the window. So there was four people in the room and a toilet at the entrance. So she goes, all right, I'll get you to t someone take you to the toilet. So this woman... She comes and wheels me into the toilet, puts me in the toilet, and then walks out of the toilet and leaves her fucking door wide open. Oh, I'm like, God. are you kidding me? Like, she's going, oh, yeah, it's in case, like, you have fall off or something. I'm like, there's a pull cord there. I said I was laying on the floor in my bedroom for five hours. No one gives a fuck. I said, why well, can you leave the toilet door open? I said, I can't. I have a shit with the door open and she's like okay so she pulls it half shut so i'm sitting there i'm like oh, fucking i can't get up and walk and get to the door and i'm like this is just fucking outrageous so so with that a visitor who's on the walls come in the toilet i'm sitting there with my strides down she's like oh sorry i'm like Oh, look, can you just shut the door, please? So she shut the door. So I'm just getting in the motion, like calming myself down, getting all ready to have a crap. And then the nurse bursts in, are you all right in there? I'm like, oh, for fuck's sake, like, just leave me alone. Let me have a shit. <laughs> Fucking hell, like. You want to take a photo of so, it as well, bitch? <laughs> so, yeah, my experience wasn't very good in hospital mm -hmm. i've got to say from um i just wanted to come home yeah. like you know as everybody goes in hospital that's all you want to do is come home and like the uh physio she come around and she went right she goes um you can't leave until you can get on your feet or at least transfer from the bed to a wheelchair, 
you know, some way, like, how are you going to go to the toilet when you're at home and all that? She said, you know, you're, you're going to have to have a bed downstairs, you're going to have to have a chair to sit in, you're going to have a special, like, you know, you need setting up. So she's, she's sitting there telling me, and I'm like this on my phone. All right. Yeah. All right, Lee. Yeah, yeah. Can you get... Can you get me? Uh, can you move my bed for me downstairs? He's like, yeah. I'm like, right. Can you get a chair for me? And within the twenty minute conversation, I was like, right. I've ordered a a chair that's being delivered like this afternoon. Like my mates moving the bed. Like, like you need to go and do a home inspection to make sure everything's set up. I said. It's 11 o'clock. You can fuck off to me house now and go and have a look. I said, because I just want to get out of here. I'm getting like three hours of sleep. I was having my very good friends, um, Sean and Mandy, they were coming down. They've been so helpful to me, which I've got a lot of respect for. So, you know, Sean was shaving me, like Mandy was washing me hair, like, and they were sorting me out. And... So it was a tough time. It's a life-changing thing. And, yeah, for sure, when I was in the hospital, I felt sorry for myself. But the guy who was in the bed next to me was proper crippled up after a stroke, and he had to be hoisted out of the bed into a chair. And and I just thought, you know what? I'm fucked, but... He's proper fucked. I could be like that. So, you know, I'll take it. If I can use one hand, I'll take it. Like, it, like, and and that's the thing that really clicked in my head from after being in the hospital for a, a month or so, thinking, oh, poor me, poor me. Yeah, of course it's a shit and it's life-changing, all the stuff that I can't do. But I'm like, all right. I can't do that, I can't do this, I can't do that, but what can I do? And, you know, the one thing I can do is use this finger and make music on the iPad. So that's my saving grace. Wow, oh, man, it's, it's such, you know, through all the shit, you know, I, I, I just think that, I, I think uh, Tom, Tom uh, Rochelle wrote in the chat, I think there are a lot of hospitals just aren't used to people fighting back. You know, and, and I saw it when I was in hospital when I, I was really sick. The people around me just seemed like they were ready to die. And I, I was in a, uh, a fucking serious blood ward with uh, blood disorders and, and haemophilia ward with <coughs> and cancer ward. And, and it just seemed like everybody around me was, was ready to die. And the nurses were pandering to that. And, you know, I, I think uh, there are a lot of people who, who, when they hear bad news, just just succumb to it so uh, I, I think it's absolutely rock and roll of you to get on the um, naughty patient list <laughs> <laughs> I mean you know it's, it, for the people who know me it won't surprise me you know what I mean I mean like you know and I say this seriously the only bit of normality I had in the hospital was when I got my iPad and I could watch Doug doing the sand test room at eight o'clock of a night. So fucked up because, you know, as much as people come and see you and, you know, it's, it's so boring in a hospital is the first and foremost thing that is boring. So you'd wait there all day, you know, and I'd be waiting... Unfortunately, the fucking cleaner would come in my room at five o'clock in the morning, bang the window wide open, bearing in mind it was November in the UK, so it was cold. She'd wipe the floor, switch all the lights on in the ward, and every day I'd say to her, excuse me, can you just shut the window when you finish and turn the lights off? And every day she went... Yeah, okay, no problem, and just fucking walked out. And I was like, after about a week of it, I was like, listen, I said, 
I'm going to fucking hobble out this bed and put that fucking mop round your head because you're fucking driving me mad in here. And she's like, oh, well, I don't know. So, again, I had to speak to the matron bird and say, look, you know, this fucking cleaner comes in here. I don't go to sleep till one or two o'clock in the morning because that's my schedule because my wife's in the state so I'm, she's five hours behind me so i'm used to phoning uh you know at one o'clock in the morning at you know midnight so my schedule hadn't changed i was still you know i was working as electrician so getting up in the morning you know, at six o'clock was normal thing for me to do. So I was only sleeping like three or four hours a night. I was like, I've just got to get home and get some sleep. This is driving me fucking mad in here. Yeah. So, so that was me driving force to get me out of there and get me home. And um, and so, then, so your brother's here, Stu, and Liz is here as well. And she says here in the chat that she got there two weeks later and uh, got off the plane straight to hospital and got him home the next day. Tell us a, a little bit about Liz. What, is, what, what, what does Liz mean to you, Russ? <laughs> I laugh. <laughs> I laugh. <laughs> I mean, what are you supposed to say about <laughs> fucking question that, eh? Oh, fucking Come put here. me right on the spot. The fucking calls me shit here, aren't you? <laughs> What does my wife mean to me? <laughs> fucking hell, what sort of a fucking stupid questions that? Hey, call, hey? call me a dickhead, just like it's just like <laughs> Doug did. <laughs> but she's obviously a, a massive part of your life. I mean, you know, we chat on Clubhouse yeah, every no, day. Yeah, of course. And, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, of course it is. It's um, you know, like, like our last together, we've just gone. Um, last saturday was our 15th wedding anniversary so and i think we've been together since 2000 2001 so you know it's we're not just you know newly happy people we're old miserable fuckers <laughs> no like like we just have a laugh together. We we're on each other's wavelengths, and we pick each other up. And then, and that's all you can really want from a partner, you yeah. know, someone who's with you through thick and thin. You know, there's days that she's down, and I'll pick her up. And there's days, well, I say days that I'm down, but I don't get really down days. I, it's not saying that I do. I like. You know, I ain't got time for that shit in my life. I'm, you know, I'm a get on and go with it person because that's all you can really do. You know, frustrated that I can't drive anymore. Yeah, for sure. But fucking determined, am I going to drive again? Yeah, for sure. You know, I, you know, it's a COVID thing that's fucked me because. Like I had all my physiotherapy stopped. I was just starting to go swimming. So like the exercise thing and all that, that's the bit that's killed me is because like where, you know, you should be really intense with um, after a stroke. Like I, I think so. I come out of hospital in November and I'd made a commitment and I was like, Right, I can't walk. I used to, like, me wife Liz used to put me on a trolley like Hannibal Lecter and when we out to the bathroom. And I was like, fucking, I tell you what, by Christmas Eve, I'm walking up them stairs and going in my bed. Uh, and I used to exercise for, like, six hours a day until Christmas Eve when... Oh, I hobbled up the stairs and got to my bed, you know, and that's a sort of determination I had because I knew my wife would have to go back to the States because, unfortunately, her sister's ill. She looks after her sister, and and I just knew I had to be able to get myself to the toilet and get a shower and get myself dressed. And from the November to the end of January, I managed to do that. And although I can't walk far, I can't, 
you know, do much, I can at least get myself up to bed of the night and I can, you know, I can knock up a, some sort of food and I can, you know, some things still fuck me, you know. It's so... There's so many things that you need two hands to do and, yeah. like, the only way which it was explained to me, which I thought was a good analogy, is put a sock on your hand for a day and then try and do everything you do. And, like, it's fucking killer because the simplest tasks, you know, are the hardest tasks. And I'm a person that does everything for himself. If if you're my mate, I'll bend over backwards. I'll be like the best mate you've ever had but i find it very hard to ask for help Mm -hmm. and you know the first probably six months that was really really difficult for me and now i'm like well you can't do it you just gotta ask on you and the thing is like whether it stops you doing stuff like so like you think, oh, I can't go out to a restaurant, can't cut me food up. I'll go out to a restaurant when that was open and you say to the waitress, oh, excuse me, I can't use my hand. Do you mind cutting this food up for me? No one ever says no. So as as long as you learn to swallow your pride and just get on with it, then that's all you can do. It's just fucking don't feel sorry for yourself. Just fucking do it. Just get on and do it because the only person that's really going to give a fuck is you and the only person that can sort it out is you. So you just have to take control of that and get on with it. Yeah, 100%. So, uh, you you know, as hard as it is, and for sure, do I have moments where I think, oh, like the... But the things that bother me the most is, oh, shit, yeah, I can't do that anymore. Oh, yeah. like, And the funniest thing about it was when the doctor come round to me, he was like, oh, I, I, I don't know how to tell you this. You, you, like, you're into music? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, I don't think you'd be able to play keyboards again. And I was like, I fucking couldn't play them in the first place. <laughs> so that's no loss for me. Like, <laughs> I, I was like, I can't play them anyway. I, like, so you just you just get on and do it. And then when you get out of hospital, the obviously there's like, I don't know if you have cancel state, whatever you call it, you have people that, you know, there's a certain thing that you have to do. So in the UK, there's a UK Stroke Society. So I'm like, okay, so there's a Stroke Society, is there? So I'd been out of hospital, I don't know, three months before I even see the woman from the Stroke Society. Now, the thing that pissed me (laughs) off the most was nobody... Nobody, like, although they'd come round, the physio would come round, you'd have people. I'm like, that's all very well and good. But how the fuck do I put a pair of socks on with one hand? Like, I was wearing slippers. And I was like, there's got to be a way. So I, so I just thought about people who, like, um, like, like get thrombosis and all that shit in their legs. Like they must sell wide socks. So, you know, I look online, find some wide socks, and then all of a sudden, oh, great, I can put my socks on. And then I'm like, right, well, if I can put my socks on, I can't do my laces up, but I can buy Velcro trainers. So, right, bang, go and buy a pair of Velcro trainers. And I'm like, well, I can't fuck me 501s up anymore. Like I, I buy tracksuits, tracksuit bottoms, so that's tracksuit bottom. I'm like, oh, when I go into the shower, I can't hold the bottle of shampoo and pour the shampoo in my hand to wash my hair. I'm like, 
I have to get someone to put in like a hand soap pump bottle so I can pump it in one hand, wash me out. And all the time I'm thinking, why the fuck don't someone tell you all this shit when you have a stroke? Like, mm-hmm. why isn't there a sheet of paper telling you all the things that you would be useful to you? You know, how to cook, how to... Like, the, some of the hardest things for me is, like, when a parcel comes, to open a parcel. Like, when Christmas come round, add your wrap a present. Like, so there's all these issues, and there's not really a lot of information, even online. So, luckily, you know, my whole job is, as an electrician, is thinking, oh, how are you going to run a wire from here to here, and how are you going to do Like, so logically, I can think logically, you know? So, that's a really big part of like problem solving has been a really big help to me because I'm able to problem solve. Then the other issue was like, so the woman from Stroke Society, like, no, so these are the professional top ranked people, right? So she comes round to my house and she's like, okay, so what's the problem? Like, oh, you've had a stroke, so are you left or right handed? I'm like, I'm right handed. I'm like, so it's fucked me because I can't use my right hand anymore. So so I can't write. So she's like, okay, well, can you just fill this form out for me? I'm like, are you fucking serious? You f- fucking idiot. Like, what do you mean fill this form out? She went, well, you know, like you can try and just fill it out. I'm like... <laughs> And you got an iPad or something? Look, I can fucking tick the boxes. I'm like, you're from the Stroke Society, knowing I can't write and Fuck. telling me to write a form out. And she's like, well, you know, you're going to have to learn how to use your other hand. I'm like, it's been three months. I'm not like fucking a magician can suddenly use my other hand, am I? So, so that really pissed me off. So... She, Anyway, we're talking all this bollocks, and I'm trying to gather information, like what's going to be useful for me. And so, so we're talking, and she's like, "Oh, what's your hobbies?" And I'm like, "Well, you know, I like motor racing, I like football." She's like, "Okay." Um, she said, uh, "I said, then you know, I like music. Music's quite a big thing." She went, "Ah." That's brilliant. She went, She went. we've got a club that you can go to. It's in Deptford, which is near to where I live. She's like, you can go to this club in Deptford and we have a, like a little chat group for about three hours on a Friday and the last half an hour is we get all the instruments out and you can play the instruments. And I'm like... I can't even play a fucking triangle, love. How do you fuck do you think I'm going to play an instrument? Like, I went, I'll tell you what, I know you're from the Stroke Society and all that. I said, but can you just fuck off? I said, because you're absolutely doing nothing for me. Like, like I can't believe how stupid you are. And she was like, oh. And I was like, well, I went the doors down there. I said, please close it behind you. I was like, fucking hell, are you serious? Like, and I've never spoke to the Stroke Society again. Like, I was like, they've rung a few times, and I'm just like, hello? And they're like, this is the Stroke Society. I'm like, oh, oh like, I'm just having the shit. I can't speak now. Like, or, like, I'm like, fucking hell, these people, like, give you no help whatsoever. It's Fuck quite me. unbelievable. Like, so, you're out there on your own, and that's what I learned is you're on your own, get on with it. And yeah. and that's the attitude I've got is just get on with it because crying about it ain't going to fucking help. And that's exactly so, what I love about you. And I'm sure everybody else is full. I can see everybody else is falling in love with you as well. So then you picked up, you got home, you had to deal with all this shit and, and put all this together and start, you know, finding ways, solutions. And then you picked up your iPad and started making music and you make amazing music what has the ipad done for you musically heather 
I mean, okay, so I was, so the first um, iPad come from my cousin who plays a guitar on the tracks that we do on um, some of the tracks. So he come round to my house with his iPad and he was like, oh, have a look at this. This is really good. And he had the cork Ike oscillator on it. And I was, now this is before me stroke, okay? So I was like, bloody hell, like you can just move your finger around on the screen and play something. And for me, who isn't a keyboard player, I was like, fucking hell, this is magic. So so I bought an iPad 2 when the iPad 2s come out. Uh, so I bought a new iPad 2 and I bought, like the regular stuff that would have been around then, I bought um, N- Nano Studio, the original one, which for me was like my old recording studio using like Cubase, that sort of setup. Like it's more of a sampler based um, thing rather than like Garage Band is for live instruments. So that suited my workflow because I work with a lot of samples whether I make my own samples and use them, but but that's a really big thing for me. And Annie Moog was out, I think, um, probably Annie Moog. um, There was a few older apps. There was, I can't think of what it's called. It was the Loopy was another app. So there was Loki, OM Guitar, um, Sunriser was about. And so the track that you opened up with tonight, um, um, Imaginarium, I made using their maps. That's probably the first real track I made on the iPad. So that's like a, a bit of a full circle. And then... Obviously now there's so many more. So I've been using iOS for a few years. So now I had to swap fingers to use the iOS, but I could still make music using like me left hand using me left finger. And so whether or not, um, I think my wife will agree with you. I, I used to make house and techno music. That's what I used to make. So I've changed from making house and techno to making more sort of soundscape some ambience, some, you know, the sort of stuff that I'm putting on my YouTube channel now, which is a bit different. And, and like, she actually likes what I'm making now rather than she'd like, I'd play her a banging techno tune and she'd be like, oh, yeah, that's nice. <laughs> but now she's like, oh, fucking hell, that's good. That sounds like, you know, like something that she'd actually listen to. So whether the stroke has changed the part of my brain that I use to make music and be more creative, I don't know. That's a possibility. So, you know, um, I'm just now in the thing of I'll give this a go. And I try and make different lots of music because I'm inspired by lots of different music, you know. So it's something that I try to do is just make, like all different sorts of sounds and you know i enjoy jumping into different genres of music and just trying it you know if it don't work out it doesn't work out but i try to mix it up a little bit and have a go at all sorts of stuff so so the ipad's been a godsend because that's really the only thing that I can sit there and do by myself. I ain't got to ask anyone to help me. I can put my headphones on my head and get on with it. Yeah, look, uh, I say it often in, in, in my life, music has saved my life many times. And I think uh, uh, you're the absolute living embodiment of that, that, that uh, living proof of that, that music really can get you through 
hard times, you know. And I'm sure there's many of us in the chat here who, like, without music, we wouldn't really be here. You hear a lot of people say it all the time, you know, without music. I, w I, w I wouldn't want to exist sometimes, you know, um, because it, it's... It saves us in so many ways with our, our feelings, it helps us get through tough times, helps us celebrate good times. And clearly, like, would you say, like, creating music now is, is more impactful than maybe before when you were making music? I think um, the difference is I've got the time to spend on it. Yep. You know, I've not got a job, I've not got thing, I've not got this, you know, like, I can... Uh, set myself up and I sort of give myself not goals but um, I've I've mentioned to you before so this year instead of working on like six tracks and doing a bit on this and getting fed up going to do something else I just start on the track and I work from it from the start to the end until it's finished move on to the next one because on my old iPad I've got heaps of tracks that I've started done, you know, like eight, 16 bars or something, and then just got bored with it. You know, if it isn't working, if it, if the flow's not there, it's not there. It's hard to, like, get on with that. And I find it harder to go back to stuff and pick up on it and move on. So this year I decided... That's it. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm just going to pick on the track, work on that track until it's finished, then move on to the next one. And that that's really helped in me personally because, you know, it, it, it gives closure to something and then, then the next thing you work on is always exciting and new and you're all into it. So rather than going back and thinking, oh, yeah, what can I... Do? You know, it takes me about a week to do a track. And uh, after... If I've been working on it for maybe two days and I'm not feeling it, I just get rid of it. Because if, it, if, it, if I can't hear the next sound in the song, I just leave it and move on. Yeah. You know, I just bin the whole thing scrap the whole whatever's been going on and just get on with working with the next project and like you know i work with my cousin now and the same thing for him which it, which i understand i can send him a track and if he's not feeling it he's like yeah i can't really put guitar on that and at first i was thinking oh man but it's the same thing you can't put your art to somebody else's just because you're told to you got to be you know with music is a feeling and if you're not feeling it there's no point trying to slog it out because yes you can get a result out of it but if it's if it's not fluid it's very difficult like it's you know it's a hard job to get to the end or you kind of rush it or so I'd just sooner now just stick to the one project at a time and give myself a goal. I think um, the last goal I've given myself was like preparing like like a set of songs, 12, 13 new songs for the music night on the sound test room. So that's happening on Monday. That's the next sort of goal of set of music I set myself to do. So I've accomplished that. I've got enough material there that I can put a video out every Monday on YouTube. And that's been my goal for this year is to try and finish something, do a video for it and release it on the Monday on YouTube. And whether I can do that all year, I don't know because I'm running out of free footage. But <laughs> that that's the goal to, to try and do that. Whether I use Visibel or whatever but i want to try and do something every week and have a result by the end of the week and put it out so i've got um like a not a back catalog but i've got some tracks in that are sitting there waiting to go which and now allows me i've got myself a month off to try and learn some of the new apps that I've been sitting there that I've bought and not had a good chance to look at yet. 
So that gives me a chance to learn them and hopefully, um, you know, like Katu's just dropped recently, hopefully if I can learn how to use it properly, it will make it even easier for me to make music. Yeah. And, you know, I'm lucky enough, you're an awesome supporter of my channel and the things that I do here. So, you know, I thank you so much for that. And every Sunday or Saturday for the people who live in the past, um, I get the privilege of mastering normally three of your tracks every week. <laughs> <laughs> I put the call out to send some tracks and you're always like, ah, oh, here's three. You don't have to do all of them. And I'm like, but I want to. So I'm really lucky to be able to do that. <laughs> so. No, I appreciate you doing them. For me, that's like the final bit, like the mastering. Yeah, I've got apps that can master, but to me, that's the... I, you know, different horses for courses, but for me, that's the uncreative part of the process to me. That like, that's the bit that, uh, you know, like I get to at the end of the week, ah, oh, fucking hell, got master it. <laughs> it's like, like I've lost the joy out of the track. Although you can do great stuff with mastering it, making it sound better, but the actual joy of the tracks sort of disappeared for me by then. I'm like. The final, you know, I will do it. it, it you know, I, you know, I have mastered all my own stuff before. It's not uh, a problem, but you know, I get encouragement when people say, "Oh, you shouldn't master your own stuff. You should get someone else to do it." I'm like, "Yeah, that suits me fine." <laughs> yeah, I love doing it too. All right, so we're getting close to the end because we've only got about 15 minutes and Pete's got a show directly after us. So what I'll we'll cut to now, just throw me, um, say, a, a, a few apps that you, you use on iOS and I'll bring them up. Things things that you can't uh, live without. Just throw us three of them because we're running out of time. And I'm the like, thing, three, okay, three things I couldn't live without yeah. is Audio Bus 2. Audio Bus. Um, where are you? Audio Bus, here we are. Audio bus. Why is it coming up with that? Oh, there we go. Audio bus. There it is. Um, I mean, I could screen. use AUM to do the stuff that I want to do, but I find to put whatever keyboard or whatever, put the effect in it, and then sample the sound that I want through audio bus for me is the easiest way. Um, the other program I couldn't live without is an app called Cog. Polypad, mm -hmm. which is is called called Polypad, called as in C H O R D oh, yeah. Polypad. Yeah, Polypad. There it is. And that allow and that allows you to choose different chords, like put them on the pads and play the chords like from the pad. So. When I'm starting a track, I normally start with the drums and then uh, selection the chords, and I'll go through Cool Polypad and I'll put it through whatever synthesizer I want to use to get the sound. And that saves me having to play chords on stuff. So that, for me, is a lifesaver. And the other thing, I'm trying to see what uh, it's called, is, a, is another old app. Now, I use a lot of ARPs in my music, um, and there's a really old app called MIDI Sequencer, and it's an old ARP app. It's a bit, there's, there's better apps, there's, you know, um, so it's just called MIDI Sequencer. Is that it there? No, uh, yeah, that's yeah, it. it. So, yeah, so you can choose the MIDI notes, and, you know, you, there's better apps out there at the moment than that, but I just like the way it works. It's, it's more of an analog feel to to get stuff to make the the apps that I use. And I normally um, like would use a keyboard in an app, and then I would sample it into Nano Studio, slew it into Slate, then do the next chord, shove that through there. So the process of my workflow is pretty long drawn out. It's a hard process, but it's a, it's the one that works for me. And like Nano Studio 2 is my go-to app. 
Like, I can't use Cubasis. Drives me mad. Like Garage Band with with what Pete's. I've been learning from Pete. Been going in his channel for a while. You know, that's something I want to start to use because when I do me guitar stuff, it's going to save me loading it into Slate and trying to chop the guitar up as samples rather than audio WAV files. So that would make my life easier. But yeah, without Nano Studio, that's my go to app. Awesome. Um, thanks so much for sharing those. So there you go, folks. Um, there's a nice list of stuff too, if you don't have, and you could see a lot of them I didn't have myself, which is pretty uh, disappointing for me. <laughs> I have so many apps, but you know, <laughs> you, you can't have everything. <laughs> like, there's still so much I'm catching up on. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, uh, Doug's favorite question. There he is. Doug's favorite question now. <laughs> um, All righty. So um russ if somebody was considering becoming creative <laughs> when would you suggest is the best time for them to start never it costs you loads of time and loads of fucking money <laughs> <laughs> at least you didn't call me a dickhead so <laughs> i'm happy about that <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what i've got for you though jay uh -oh. is um oh, no <laughs> Well, I know you was disappointed with Vittoria and they wouldn't send you, like, your book. On the notepad? Like, your, um, your notepad. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> What's Hang on. Let me go full screen for you. Oh, my God. We all fucking rise together, Jade Star. <laughs> Oh, man, that, that is amazing, <laughs> dude. Oh, my God, man, that is sensational. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's so much better than the Arturia fucking notepad. <laughs> Screw Art Arturia, if you're watching, thanks for the, not sending me the notepad. Fuck you, I don't need it anymore. I've, I've got my own notepad now. <laughs> oh, look, um, thank you so so much uh russ for coming on no here. thank you and um, thank you for everyone who's coming here I've, uh, i can't really see the chat rolling too much but i know some of my friends and family and all you other guys those channels i go to and that i appreciate it because i do learn from you guys and you know i do enjoy spending time in your channels well, you know, it goes both ways. Thank you so much. I mean, you know, uh, we met here on my channel. We chat every day on Clubhouse. Folks, if you aren't in in involved in Clubhouse, get involved in it. It's not all about, um, you know, I make a million dollars, here's how. Every day we open a, a little room up with a whole bunch of us music creators and we hang in there and we chat shit. We talk about Sticky Vicky. Um, so if you don't know who Sticky Vicky is, we have to give it a mention. This is Sticky Vicky. Uh, <laughs> we have to do it. We have to do it, don't we? Sticky Vicky uh, is a wonderful performer who used to blow things <laughs> blow things out of her vagina. So uh, she's a bit of a legend amongst us on Clubhouse. Uh, she's used to, what's it say here? She used to blow uh, ping pong balls, eggs, handkerchiefs, sausages, razor blades and machetes out of her uh, JJ. So she's a bit of a legend. But this is the kind of stuff we talk about over on Clubhouse. And we've, we've created a really good bond, a, a good friendship over there. And we chat every day. And it's, it's just awesome fun. You make such fantastic music. You really are an inspiration to me. I appreciate me. that. You, you, you inspire me every day, man. And this is why I wanted to have you on the show. Because, you know, we, we sometimes take things for granted like the... the, the and, and think the world's caving in on us and i'm just absolutely inspired by you every day you know what's been thrown at you and you just you get up and you just you just kick it you just kick it every day and it's it absolutely impresses me so much i'm so so proud to be your friend well, that's all you can do yeah that's all you can do i'm i'm glad you're me mate as well because you've helped me out as same as doug same as pete you know it's because it's good it's nice you know yeah and like i've got a lot of friends uh, that i've made through the channels you know tom baba and you know all these people that are, are there every day that we're chatting gary you know there's 
like Stu and Andy, who incidentally, I want to say, I've seen so many bands. The only band I want to see now is Indigo Sunset. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Let's hope when everything opens up, we all get to see them live. So, all right, folks, um, I want to remind you all. So on Monday, I think it's Monday your time for, for your stream with Doug. Uh, yeah, Monday uh, 8 o'clock UK. Yeah, Monday 8 p.m. UK. Doug is streaming um, Ross's music, so make sure you remember that and get over there. I'll be there. We'll all be there. Um, Pete's got a stream up next on uh, Studio Live today, so he's doing a busking jam, so if you want to head over there. And before we go, I have to do this. I can't forget, so... I, I, I nearly forgotten. I just looked at my sheet, so you'll just have to bear. <laughs> I nearly, I normally always forget, and you know this, but I just remembered because we've got a giveaway I have to do. <laughs> so we have to do the bloody giveaway, man. So look, luckily there was only nine people. Normally it's like 30 odd people, but only nine people entered for Fractal Bits. So let's do the magic thing. We've got four copies of this to give away. Let's do it nice and quick. Who's the winners? Number nine is Bonnie Tyler. Bonnie Tyler's the winner, Bonnie Tyler. Let me go up here. I don't have it on the screen, do I? There we go. Um, let's go to this screen so you can see everything. Uh, small screen. There we go. So Bonnie Taylor was the first winner. Let's generate another number. Who has number four? Globe Flicker, who's in the chat. Well done, Globe Flicker. You win a copy of, of uh, Fractal Bits. Uh, let's do another one. We've got four copies. Number one, iOS Music Man. Hey, man, you missed out on the other one, but you won this one. So congrats. And the last one, is it going to be Russ? Oh, it's number nine. It's already to be done. Come on, Russ. Seven Russ wins. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> Everyone's a winner, baby. That's the truth. <laughs> well done, Russ. So not only have you come on the show, you absolutely won the prize as well. So you deserve, <laughs> you deserve it, man. And you can see we're not cheating, folks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, well, thanks, and thanks to the other winners. Congratulations. Yeah, congrats to everybody. So what we're going to do now, we are going to go out with one of your tracks. And um, once again, thank you for being on here. We're going to play India, which is... Uh, an... Okay, thanks for everyone for turning up tonight. I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all so much. So this is India by Russ, double eight eight nine. All the, his links are in the description. Go subscribe to him on uh, YouTube if you haven't already, because if you haven't, you're mad. All right, go and do that. And... Um, this is India. I'll see you all again tomorrow for another show. Thank you so much for all being here. You broke the record, folks. Russ got more people here than Heinbach and Jordan Rudess. You've smashed the record, man. You are the champion. Love you so much. You, you did it, man. I told you you were going to do it. <laughs> so, I'm the Olympian, not the champion. <laughs> all right, folks. Have a fantastic day. We'll see you over at Pete's. And uh, adios, amigos. Be good to each other. Keep making mistakes and do the things that make you happy. We shall see you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Adios. And remember to mute your mic, Russ. <laughs> nice one. Let's... Fucking joking, and you're going to talk all over it. Fuck you up. <laughs> Alrighty, see you later, folks. Oh, I'm, I'm all over the place now. Here we go. Uh, full screen and... Yeah!